precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of your sins or mine. Had it not been for a place called Mount Calvary, had it not been for a man called Jesus, my soul would forever be lost. And yours would too. We're going to begin with the symbol of Christ's blood. A prototype found in the Old Testament, the shedding of the blood of an animal. A lamb, a goat, a bullock, without spot or blemish, had to be offered. That blood had to be shed as a token or a type of the precious blood of Christ that was to come. And back in the Old Testament, we find that the Old Testament saints, they look forward to the cross of Christ and the shed blood of Christ with faith toward it. We look backwards to the cross as an accomplished fact. They look with faith that it would come. We look with faith that it's been done. Praise God. Don't make a difference. Them fellas had the same, they had to have the same kind of faith, faith and grace we had even under the law. There had to be grace and there had to be faith. Now you we want to abrogate everything under the law, but you can't do it. Because we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, their word, and Jesus is the chief cornerstone. Amen. That's in the Bible, you know. Ephesians 2, 19 and 20. All right. In Leviticus, the 17th chapter, beginning in verse 10, on the precious blood of Christ. And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, that eateth any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eateth blood, and will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. I love that statement. This next one especially. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It's the blood. It was the blood under the law that was a type of the blood of Christ. And now our faith looks back to that cross as a or an accomplished fact that we don't have to have the blood, but we know that blood was shed for the remission of our sins. And by faith in his blood, we receive forgiveness of sins. Praise God. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul and mine without the shedding of blood. And the Lord, I'd like for you to note in passing here, says, if you eat any manner of blood, God will cut you off from among your people. He'll cut that soul off. You're not to eat anything with the blood. And it still is a legitimate, a very legitimate statute or law. It's whatever you want to designate it. God certainly condemns the eating of blood or the drinking of blood of an animal. All right, I want you to go back with me to the book of Exodus when the blood first began here. That is by the commandment of the Lord. We find in the third chapter of Genesis about the shedding of blood. How Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain because he offered blood. And Cain offered a vegetable sacrifice. And God did not accept the offering of Cain. He, uh, he accepted the offering of Abel. And the Bible calls him righteous because he offered the blood of a lamb for his sins. Now back to Exodus the 12th chapter. This is Israel in Egypt. And God's getting ready to deliver them out of Egypt's bondage. And he gave them this commandment speaking in, from the Lord in verse 1. The Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. See, this is when the year starts, and in that month, the 14th day especially, is the Passover. And that's when God passed over the people of Israel because the blood was put over their doorposts. Now he says, You speak to all the congregation, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of, his, of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count 
for the Lamb. Your Lamb shall be without blemish. That's the type of Christ. There could be no blemish, no imperfections. It had to be perfect. One color, no scarred places, no imperfections or blemishes of any sort. Could be upon it a male of the first year. You know, here in the end time, they're trying to bring Christ and God down and make them unisex. That's becoming a national vice among these apostates that have changed the Bibles. Now they're trying to change God and Christ into being unisex. They're neither man nor woman. They're neither male nor female. <coughs> that might be true in eternity, but it's not true now. All right, Jesus is a man. The man. 1 Timothy 2 and 5 between us and God is a man, not a woman or not a unisex. The man, Christ Jesus. All right? To be an example or a prototype of Christ, he had to be without blemish. He had to be a male of the first year. You take it out from the sheep or the goats. You keep it up until the 14th day. That's the Passover. Then you'll take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. All right? Verse 13, and the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, as we sung that beautiful hymn of the church a few minutes ago, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Might this not be a symbol of our deliverance in the tribulation period arising? Might this not be, a, be symbolic of the protection that God will afford to us that are under the blood when pestilence and earthquakes and famine and terrorism begins to rise in the next few months in this gathering storm of God's judgments? I believe it is. Praise God. If we're under the blood, God will protect us. We'll be in the right place at the right time and have God's angels in complete charge of whatever the situation is. Now we hasten over to the New Testament with these types and prototypes. We want to take them in consideration beginning in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. And Paul writes very wonderfully here, very descriptively and plainly, understandably here about this transition from the law to grace and the blood of, from the blood of bulls and of goats to the blood of Christ. All right, in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse 11. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, or our body, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, his own blood. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh that is under the law, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God to purge who? Your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And over in the 20th chapter, John is speaking here about Christ entering into the holy place and taking his blood and offering it for our eternal redemption. You remember the first person he had a conversation with was Mary at the tomb after his resurrection. And as he was there at the tomb, he appeared suddenly. Mary was standing weeping. And she thought he was a gardener. And he says to her, said, Woman, why are you standing there weeping? <laughs> She said, because they've come and taken my Lord away, taken his body away. And then Jesus spoke to her and said, in the voice that she had heard many times, Mary. Oh, she says, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, great goodness. And she started to go down to his feet and grasp him. Don't touch me. Don't touch me yet. For I have not yet ascended to my Father and to your Father. To my God and to your God. She wasn't the first to touch him. Then that afternoon, while the disciples were all in the chamber, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, still in John 20, Jesus stood and said, Oh, hail! 
And they, they were afraid. And there was a fellow in there, one of his disciples, apostles named Thomas, and he told them, he said, I don't believe what them women said. I don't believe them women <laughs> <laughs> he says, I wouldn't believe unless I could see them prints in his hands and thrust my hand in his side and feel the scar that's left from that sword that went into his side. And about that time he hadn't got through talking it very good and Jesus appeared. And he looked at it, Thomas said, Thomas, he says, come thrust your hand in my side and look at the prints of the nails in my hands and be not faithless. And he felt, he said, my Lord and my God. <laughs> Praise God. He was the first one to touch him. And over in 1 John 1, John the great apostle writes, said, we've handled the prince of life, the word of God. We've handled it. <laughs> they all got to touch it. Praise God. I tell you, those fellows write to us about the story of the crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension back to heaven as our high priest. And it's all through the blood of Jesus that we have access to God through him as our high priest. He wouldn't be a high priest if he hadn't given his blood. He had to die or he would have never made it back to heaven and be at the right hand of the Father. That was his only way back. If he hadn't have willingly laid down his life and given his blood as an atonement for your soul and mine, he would not have made it back to heaven and stayed at the right hand of God he'd still be in the grave. My, that tells us something. And Jesus said, if I'm giving my life for you, then you ought to lay down your lives for the brethren. Look what I did for you. I tell you, it's hard sometimes for us to remember just what Jesus did for you and I. Now continuing in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews, verse 24, he continues. He said, Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, like the temple in Jerusalem and the tabernacle. He's gone to a better place, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. How about that? Jesus, he didn't go into a place that was made with hands, which are the figures. The tabernacle was the figure of what's in heaven, but that's not where he is. But he's in the presence of God for us, nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. In other words, God's saying here, he's not going to die but one time. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And I tell you, Jesus Christ is in the high place that he himself won through his own sacrifice, his own suffering. But he did it vicariously for you and I. That one day, as he said in Revelation 3.21, He that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne as I have overcome and am set down with my Father in His throne. We must give our lives to Jesus and for Jesus, for the brethren's sake, for the elect of God. There is a price for us to pay to receive the glory that He Himself wants to share with us. We must suffer for it. For if we suffer with Him, we shall also reign with Him. You're not going to make it unless there's some suffering on your part and mine. All right, going on to Hebrews 10, as Paul continues this great masterpiece of telling us exactly what the law did and what grace has accomplished that was so superior to the law, the blood of bulls and of goats is not efficacious any longer. It's the blood of Christ. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 10, by the which will... We are sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ once for all, his body. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till he, his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering 
hath he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Praise God, one offering he made to sanctify us with a perfection that will last eternally. And then in Hebrews, the 13th chapter, continuing, verses 12 and 13, the scripture continues. All right, wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. And I tell you, this book of Hebrews is something else as Paul the Apostle, with the great revelation and inspiration of the Holy Ghost, shows us here how redemption through the blood of Christ was foreshadowed through the blood of the bulls and the goats of the Old Covenant. Now back to Hebrews 9 just for a few moments here. In completion here, the revelation as Paul gave it in the book of Hebrews. In, Re in Hebrews 9 verse 22, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And I want to show you something else here in passing. In verse 3 of chapter 10. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. God only just overlooked them. It kind of hit them for one year from the piercing eyes of God. It uh, vicariously became a substitute for a man, a woman, or a penitent sinner for one year. But at the end of that year, you better show up on the first day of that next year with your sacrifice, and that sacrifice must be without spot or blemish. It must conform to the teachings of the law of Moses for God to accept it. And it must be accepted with a broken spirit and with a contrite heart or God did not receive it. Psalm 51, 17, the psalmist David said really it wasn't the bull or the goat or the lamb. But he said the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that I will not despise. Amen. If that worshiper who came to offer the sacrifice for his sins at the beginning of the new year, that day of Passover. If he didn't come with that broken spirit and that contrite heart, that blood did not count for the sins that he would commit that year. And he was out from under the covering of the blood of Jesus Christ that he should look to by faith. And he was lost as far as God was concerned because he did not look with faith at the blood of Christ, that Redeemer. Their Messiah who would come and pay a debt that he did not owe. Praise God. And they couldn't pay the debt that they did owe. And they had to look with faith. That little lamb and that blood meant there was coming a Messiah that would pay the debt in full. And if they didn't look to it with faith, with a broken spirit and a contrite heart, then the covering of their sins was not possible. And so it is under grace. Too many people today... They frustrate the grace of Christ. For the Bible tells us plainly in 1 John 1 and 7, But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have confidence one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanseth us from all sin. But we must walk in the light, for the blood of Christ does not cover our sins. We must walk in the light of God's Word. Stepping in the light. Praise God if that blood is going to be efficacious for our sins. Again, to make it efficacious, 1 Peter 1 and 7, or 1 and 2 rather says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Praise God, we're called and chosen and separated and put into the body of Christ through the shed blood of Jesus Christ if we accept it with obedience, with an obedient mind, with a submissive mind will that is broken to the will of Jesus Christ. And the scripture confirms it very readily in, for instance, Ephesians 1 and 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Then again in Colossians 1, 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness 
of sins. Well, that's wonderful. But we get to look and see what Jesus Christ himself said about this great work of Calvary and its fulfillment and completion and what it means to you and I from the lips of Jesus Christ. Let's check it out in the 26th chapter of Matthew. Matthew, the 26th chapter, beginning in verse 26. As they were eating, this is the night of his betrayal, the Last Supper, or the Passover Supper. Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it. Now this was something Jesus said, and it's mentioned in Luke, the 22nd chapter. And I like those words. These are synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But there's variations in the revelation that one received from the Lord and the other. And it's not in the different, it's not in the similarities that is so meaningful. I think the meaningful part is in the differences. That one received a revelation, the other did not. Or the Holy Ghost brought to one's remembrance something, the other did receive. That's fine. Praise God. No hang up there. No problem. But listen to this. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, he said, With desire have I desired to eat this last supper with you. With desire. I have desired it. Man, it was a burning element in his very nature. That, boy, I've got, I just, this is the thing I'm driving to, I'm looking forward to. The last, you might say, the last act of Jesus Christ in teaching, in admonishing, and having fellowship with his disciples before his crucifixion was that last supper in which he would institute the Passover. And that's where the Passover started. And the church was there. It started in Egypt back in the church of old. But for us, it started the night that Jesus ate with his disciples. Praise God. It's beautiful. All right, he said, drink you all of it from that cup. For this is my blood of the New Testament. See now? He's turning from the old to the new, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. My blood, not water, not communion, not some other ceremony it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's only in a perpetuation of a memory that these ordinances in the church has a part or parcel of. In the perpetuation as a memorial. God, they have mercy. People want to take water baptism. I know it's an act of obedience. Shoot, paying your tithes is an act of obedience. Going to church is an act of obedience. Reading the Bible, praying is an act of obedience. That's not what saves you. You're saved through the blood, and there's nothing else can save you. Nothing else you can do. Repent, and the Lord forgives you and puts blood, the blood of Christ, over your soul. When you receive Christ through repentance. All right, he said, this is my blood of the New Testament. Hey, that New Testament was sealed with his blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins, or I say, their sins. And I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine. And it wasn't wine, it was grape juice he was drinking. He calls it here, I thank God for that, the fruit of the vine. That's grape juice. I ain't never seen no grape you could squeeze wine out of, and you never did. Crazy bunch. I said they're a crazy bunch. Amen. Amen. That's the truth. Talking about drinking wine. The Bible condemns it from stem to stern, from cover to cover, and then some old jerk come along, oh, Jesus drink wine. No such a thing. He said, I won't drink henceforth with you of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new. And new wine is grape juice. When I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The gist of the message is, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Hey, do you consider yourself one out of that many that he shed that blood for? Who did Jesus really shed his blood for? The world? No. He shed it for the 
the benefit of the world and the people that are in the world that are his elect called out of the world. Jesus always talked in terms when he prayed, he says, Lord, I'm not praying for you to take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil of the world. They're not of the world, even as I'm not of the world. Acts 20, 28, he says, to the elders of the church at Ephesus, I want you to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What was the blood of Christ shed for? To purchase the church of God. That means real, real Christians. Genuine saints. Yeah. That's who that blood was shed yeah. for. And, and he knows who, who are his. Yeah. First Peter 1 and 2 again, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctif sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Elect, foreknowledge, and blood. And that's the way you get saved. Praise the Lord. Because God knows those that are His. The Lord knows before you're ever saved who's His. He's got a book written before the foundation of the world. You ever read that? Revelation 17 and 9. Whose names were written in the book of life. From the foundation of the world. If you're not written there, you're going to wonder after the beast, the Antichrist, when he comes. But he said that blood was shed for many. It's amazing how he said many there. In other places he said few. But what he's talking about there, in all the course of history, there are many. But in any, any one generation, there are only a few. And that's true in both respects. You've got to have respect for it. All right. Turn over with me to the 20, 23rd chapter of Luke. I want to show you something here about the blood of Jesus. And on the day of his crucifixion, what happened that day? And what might happen to you and I if we don't accept it right? Matthew 27, beginning in verse 3. What did that say? I beg your pardon. <laughs> it's, yeah, it is. Matthew 27. Did I say it right? Verse 3. I thought I said it wrong there. Okay, beginning in verse 3, Matthew 27. And Judas, which betrayed him when he saw he was condemned repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priest and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went out and hanged himself. I tell you, you try to walk over the blood of Jesus, you, you, <laughs> you're going to fall into condemnation and into judgment. You're not going to get anywhere in this world, the world to come. You might not hang yourself, but you might as well be hanged. Jesus said, if you offend one of my little ones, it's better that you were hanged. A stone hanged on your neck and cast into the sea. Judas sold Christ for 30 pieces of silver. How much are Americans today selling Christ for? How much are Christians auctioning Christ off for? Hanging over their CDs and their money and their pleasures and their possessions materially and their old hang-ups, their old perverted appetites, selling Christ for a pittance. They don't even get 30 pieces of silver, a lot of them. God, have mercy sakes. All right, going to verse 19. Let's see what else happened. His judge was named Pilate. When he sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. The chief priests and elders of the multitude asked Barabbas and that Pilate should destroy Jesus. And the governor, governor then answered and said to them, Whither the twain will you that I release unto you? Give us Barabbas. And he said, What shall I do then with Jesus which is called Christ? They all said unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, And he was alarmed. He was fearful after his wife told him she'd had a dream. What evil hath he done? But they cried the more, Let him be crucified. And when Pilate saw he could prevail nothing, but rather the tumult, a riot was made, he took water, got a pan of water, and he washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. See you to it. I'm going to tell you one thing. The Jews are not the only ones that's guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. There's millions of Americans 
and people in the Western world that have knowledge of God that are equally guilty of selling Christ out for a penance. Then answer the people, all the people, his blood be on us and on our children. When you reject Christ and trample his blood under his feet, his blood's going to be on you and on your children if you have any. God, have mercy sakes. Let's go a little bit further in this chapter, verse 54. Now there's a centurion there that plunged that sword in the side of Jesus and opened up his side for that fountain that we sing about. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty state. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly, this man was the Son of God. In Luke's account, said they beat on their chest. Oh, this in desperation and futility. What have we done? What have we done? This man, we've killed him. He's the Son of God, and we've killed him. It really wasn't the Roman soldiers that killed him. It was them Jews that killed him. But more than that, it was your sins and mine. He wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for that. They never got him. That old song says, it's, it's recorded here in the 26th chapter of Matthew. It said, don't you know presently I could call the Father and he'd send me more than 12 legions of angels? But this is what I came for. Then they made a song. He could have called 10,000 angels and destroyed the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. That's what he's doing up there. The world looks at that with enmity. They look at it with abhorrence. Or they look at it with just nonchalance. And I'm going to tell you something. That's not the way God felt about it. God put his son up there hanging between heaven and hell on this earth. There's a blockade. All right. Look up, look to him and live, or else I'll put you in hell if you reject my son. You trample his blood under your feet, and I'll put you in hell, and I'll burn you forever. Now there he is. What are you going to do with him? We're everyone going to have to do what Pilate did. What will we do with this man, Jesus, which is called the Christ? Oh, I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to absolve myself of any guilt. No, you're not. It was your sins and mine that put him up there, drove them needles in his hands and feet, that pierced his brow with thorns, that put that sword in his side. Your sins and mine. He could have called angels. That old centurion smote his breast and in Luke's account says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Hey, that man was the son of God. Be merciful to him. Lord, have mercy. I like Luke's account. Let's go there just for a moment. It's too good to pass up. Luke 23. Luke, the 23rd chapter. The wonderful, amazing record here. Verse 39. And one of the malefactors which were hanged, see, it was, Jesus was up there on one cross in the middle. There was two... One on each side. And there were two malefactors. They were murderers. One on one side, one on the other. Thieves and murderers. And one of those malefactors which were hanged railed on him saying, If you be Christ, save yourself and us. That's the way it is today. But the other answering rebuked him saying, Don't you fear God seeing you're in the same condemnation? You're getting killed too. What are you doing that for? And we are getting killed justly for we, we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing to be crucified for. And then that penitent one, that with some common sense, that with some real uh, deserting of that opportunity that that other did not deserve, opportunity of life was there just for a fleeting moment, and it be gone. 
He turned to the Lord and cried out, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Just in the nick of time. When Jesus was about to yell, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that dark hour, the darkest hour of man's history, when men reached their lowest depths, when the legions of hell clamored and shouted exultantly, we killed the Prince of Life. We won. Here's a discerning man through the Spirit. He cried for Jesus to remember. And listen to the words of Christ. The answer. And Jesus said unto him, Truly, verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. That blood. It was the blood that saved him. Praise God. Saved by the skin of his teeth. But saved just in the nick of time. Thank God for that. Now the Bible warns us of some things we can do and never get saved. Walking over that blood. Revelation 1, 4 and 5 said, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. That's Christ. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is a faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us. Change it like this. Unto him that loves me and washed me from my sins in his own blood. If you'll accept it. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. In 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. God didn't use money to buy you off the slave market that the devil had you chained to. Adam and Eve, your first parents, sold you down the river. The first Adam sinned and betrayed us. The second Adam came and he didn't submit to the wiles of the devil. He prevailed, overcoming. And bought us back off the slave market if we'll accept it. We weren't redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation, your old vain lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's what bought you and I off the slave market. That's why we don't have to get out and sin. We don't have to get out and smoke and drink and commit adultery and the things the world is doing to have peace and joy and to be filled with a love that passeth all understanding that God sheds abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost in the person of Christ. We have the love of Christ in us that we love things that are pure and holy and honest and true and just and loving. He puts his love in us. Christ will only want to save us. He wants to live in us. He wants to live in our lives and through our lives and work through us for his glory. And when he transforms us out of from death to life, out of sin into righteousness, he transforms us out of weakness into strength. He takes that old nature and helps us hang it on a cross and gives us a new nature a new heart, a new soul, a new spirit, a new mind, then we have all the equipment we need to glorify God as Jesus Christ glorified Him here upon this earth. And that is our inheritance. But alas, the Bible tells us in Hebrews, the sixth chapter, beginning in verse 4, a warning to every backslider, a sinner, or hypocrite. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift, and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the world to come, if they'll fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh. Crucifying Christ all over again is something God the Father will not tolerate. There's no long-suffering, no patience for that mess. 
If you fall away to renew you again into repentance when you crucify the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame, it is impossible to be led back to repentance. God, have mercy. You mess around and consider the blood of that covenant wherewith you were sanctified an unholy thing and if done despite unto the spirit of grace, there's nothing left but a fearful looking for a fiery judgment and indignation. I'd like to show that to you in the 10th chapter of Hebrews rather than just trying to quote it to you. Verse 26 beginning in Hebrews 10. For if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Remember, it says plural. Now it's not talking about that inward sin, that propensity to sin, that body of sin that we're delivered from when we're saved. It's talking about S-I-N-S, plural. There's no more sacrifice for them sins you're committing, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. So will the blood of Jesus cleanse you from every sin? No. There's rebellion against God's word that the blood of Jesus does not clean you from. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. How much sore punishment? Now I've said under the law, if you violated Moses' law, which had the blood as an atonement, and they died without any mercy, how much sore punishment suppose you shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace trying to keep you back from doing it. For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's one thing to know Christ. It's another thing to walk with him and to keep your sins under the blood of Jesus, under his blood. When I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. Judgment is coming. All will be there. He who rejected, he who refused, O oh, sinner, hasten and let Jesus in. And God will pass, will pass over you. When I see the blood, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass, I will pass over you. I thank God he's made a perpetuation for our sins and Jesus is on the right hand of the Father. When we turn to him in full repentance and confession that he looks at the Father and makes intercession for us and he says, Father, that's one that my blood was shed for. I shed my blood for him. I shed my blood for her. And you know the fact about the matter is it's been said and it's true. If there had been only one sinner upon this earth dying lost on his way to hell, Christ would have died for that one person. If it had only been one, he died for an individual. He didn't die for a massive group. He died for you and me personally. He saw you lost. He saw me lost. He saw you and I on our way to hell. And for you or I, he would have died had we been the only ones. And when we think of that love and that grace that was shared, abroad for your sins and mine. That God gave His Son, God gave, and Jesus came and willingly. He didn't have to go. He didn't have to go to that cross. He could have retained His Sonship. He wouldn't have had that honor. He wouldn't have had the same reward that He has. But he, could have, he could have got back to heaven and still been the Son of God. He wouldn't have had that same place position at God's right hand as high priest but he didn't have to die he said I could have called for angels to deliver me but for this hour I was born that's why I came to die to give my life he said no man taketh my life from me I lay my life down and I'm going to take it up again I'm doing it willingly I want you to know that he says that I'm dying for you because of love, not because of a compelling 
force because the Father sent me and said, you've got to do it. It's love that's constraining me. And it's the love of Christ that should constrain us to continue on, to walk with God and let Christ have full access to our hearts and lives and keep our soul under the blood of Jesus. If you're not under that blood, the wrath of God abideth on you and it may fall any moment upon you. You just don't know when God's grace has ended, when God's long-suffering and patience has become threadbare or is no longer working in your behalf. I Thank you, Jesus. I am the Lord and I have spoken. And that which I have done has been accomplished. And it was accomplished because that I have reached toward you with love and affection because of your sins, because of my righteousness that has been insulted by sin to keep you from going into the place of torment that I made for the devil and his angels. And I've sent my son to stand between you and hell to keep you out of that awful place of torment. Now receive my word. Hear it. Let it sink down into your heart and move with fear and save yourself from the destruction that's coming upon those that forget me, saith God, for I will surely judge you. I will call you into judgment for your sins. They will separate you and me forever. But if you hearken to my voice, I will forgive you. And you'll be my son and daughter forever. And I will certainly take care of you and all that's arising that my prophets have spoken of. And I, the Lord thy God, will bless thee and be with thee I have gone to prepare a place for thee that I will come again and receive you into. If you'll hearken to my voice and receive me. For I am the only way, the truth and the life. And you cannot come to the Father except by me. Now save yourselves by believing, confessing, and receiving, saith the Lord. For I am in your midst to give you the blessings of Calvary. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Lord, receive.